So welcome everybody. I'm Dr. Leslie Alvarez. I'm a professor of psychology here at Adams State. And about two years ago, I went to a psychology conference. And in the exhibition hall, I found these lovely little cards. These have a bunch of male pioneers of psychology. This one has a bunch of female pioneers. And you can probably tell from back there that there's more of these than there are of these. And I looked at the back of these for the women and saw a description of what they did. And I thought, this is fabulous. I'm going to share it with my students. And then I looked at the back of the men, and there's nothing. Because of course you know what the hell they did. <laughs> and so this silent sexism really pissed me off. And it bothered me for a while. And then I looked at a textbook that I chose for a class that I was teaching. And it mentioned one of these women once. It was her area of psychology. They mentioned her once. The sentence after they mentioned her they followed up with what a man did better and how he improved upon her work. And so those seeds planted some concern over what do we know about women in the history of psychology, and in particular, women of color. And that led, my anger led me to these questions that these students and I have been exploring for the last um, almost full school year. All of these amazing, fabulous students, which I'm about to introduce you today, started last semester on a volunteer basis doing this research with me, and now we're examining it in the context of a class. So we are super excited to share with you what we've learned today, and I'm gonna turn it over to Michaela, Jerome, Marissa, Chelsea, Jonah, and Rachel. Thank you. This Hi. is where you clap. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm Michaela Weiser. I'm Jerome Rodriguez. We will be focused on the historical and contemporary barriers while Marissa and Chelsea will look at the survey, recognizing diversity. And close enough will be Jonah and Rachel looking at the content analysis representing diversity. But women in psychology. In 1995, APA, APA report found that there's a growing change in the gender composition of psychology, meaning that as far as enrollment and degree retrieval, women were on the rise and men were kind of stagnating. Now despite this trend, consistent now is found regarding prejudice, occupational segregation, educational marginalization, as well as barriers to promotion and acknowledgement, which Michaela will elaborate on. So I'll get into some historical barriers first, but it's important to note that women of this time were often regarded as more useful in applied fields rather than scientific, meaning that they wanted us in child development and educational testing because they thought we had different personalities, different mentalities, and were way more open to suggestion than our male counterparts. So first we have the marriage benefit. Um, this is Raymond Cattell. I could not find a picture of his wife, Karen Shetler, but he um, established the Institute for Personality and Ability Testing. Um, due to lack of funding and lack of organizational skills, um, he utilized his wife to do pretty much everything and get everything um, up and running and put it on his feet. And she did all of that while also being a mathematics professor at a university. Um, and then once everything was all said and done, the credit that he gave her was with some help from my wife. This is Raymond Dodge. Um, I also could not find a picture of his wife or even her name, but he was an experimental psychologist, and when he got his first job as a professor, he said that it was such a great help to have his wife, because when he didn't feel like teaching class, she could. Um, next are barriers in education. Um, with Christine Ladd Franklin, we see the issue of withholding degrees. So she was denied her degree from Johns Hopkins in 1882. Mary Whitman Calkins was denied her PhD from Harvard in 1895. Margaret Floyd Washburn left Columbia University after being told that she would not be admitted as a real graduate student. She could just kind of sit in the back of the class and take notes. Um, but luckily she moved on to Cornell, so I think she did okay. And then this is Beth Dahl. Um, in the 1970s, an advisor told her that she should probably not pursue graduate studies because he was worried that she would forego her studies halfway through to start a family. So she didn't listen and she got her PhD. Um, next we have the problem of nepotism. Um, once women obtained their degrees, they faced the issue of finding employment in major university settings. Um, Anti-nepotism policies uh, pretty much said that if your husband worked at this institution, you probably couldn't. And um, so this happened to Mary Cover Jones. She was an incredible psychologist, as was her husband, but uh, she was denied the status of full professor. 
and actually did not achieve that until 30 years later. Um, and today, one in every four institutions still has an anti-nepotism policy in place. Um, another example of this is James and Eleanor Gibson. They were both employed at uh, Smith, and once the head of their department passed away, they moved on to Cornell, and even though they had been teaching for years and years, she was told that she was no longer allowed to teach. Um, and then, of course, we have the issue of discrimination. This is Inez Beverly Prosser. She was the first African-American woman to earn her PhD in psychology, and that was in 1933. However, 44 years later, um, the percentage of psychology doctorates earned by people of color was 6.7%. And then we're going to touch real quick on intersectionality. This pretty much says that things are bad for women and things are bad for people of color, but if you are a woman of color, it's the worst for you. Um, they're often expected to head committees on um, minority issues or advise students of the same demographic on top of their regular workload. This is Mamie Phipps Clark. She has an incredible impact, but um, when she presented her thesis, it earned her a spot at Columbia. However, a male professor almost uh, presented the thesis instead and wanted to take credit for her work. Um, you see here with her not only the issue of discrimination, but um, the issue of finding a job due to the nepotism issue. Uh, a quote from her is, although my husband had earlier secured a teaching position at the City College of New York, following my graduation, it soon became apparent to me that a black female with a PhD in psychology was an unwanted anomaly in New York City in the 1940s. So, this here is just a quick graph that kind of shows you numbers-wise where the intersectionality comes into play. You can see that the most recent year, 2010, the number of psychology doctorates awarded to white women is 2,728, and to minority women, it's 927. Okay. The report, The Changing Gender Composition, Composition of Psychology, or CGC2, is a second addition to the original 1995 report. It used current data and highlighted four key points. Overall, the findings presented in each area established there is a continuing trend of women in psychology, and that despite this, there's a disparity in relation to men. And there's an areas of importance that they highlight. These are psycho psychology in a socio-culture context, education and training of psychologists, employment of psychologists, as well as professional activities of psychologists. All right, the first point, psychology in a socio-culture context, this one point was just to verify that the trend has continued from the original report. You can see that the top three consist of white women, <coughs> white men, followed by minority women. The second point, education and training of psychologists. Since the original report, this, um, I'm sorry, psychology as a discipline has become more diverse with the rise in women who have reached the doctorate level migrating to health service fields due to lack of equal opportunities in areas such as academia. Looking at the graph on the left, you can see that the top three fields are health, secondary and primary education, and education. The health service and research doctorates graph shows that health service subfields have, have been on the rise since before the original report in 1984 while research subfields has remained consistent with a small dip in 2002. The third point, employment of psychologists, addresses the gender-based inequality in, psych in psychology. Despite women making up the majority base, inequality in pay, job position, as well as position advancement are all present, which are combated by higher debt, especially among older students and minoritized women. The final point, professional activities of psychologists. This one divulges on the modern role that women must pay or must play to or undertake to achieve the same level as men. For women, marriage and children contribute more significantly to time, especially when it comes to facilitating a professional career. Women are more likely to be employed part-time or in some cases unemployed, regardless of education, experience, and aspiration. So where are we now? Um, the point of this is that a lot of the historical barriers that were faced by women are faced by contemporary women. Um, there's all kinds of movement pushing for further involvement of women in science, um, and there's a lot of social media buzz surrounding this. Um, 
For example, we have hashtag, this is what a professor looks like, that pretty much shows you that professors today break the mold of what you would expect. Um, you know, they're not as traditional as you would think. Um, so this is why we care, because there are people out there that are making an impact that deserve recognition, and so that's what we based our study off of. All right, so to get into looking at this on a more quantitative level, we also have a bit of rationale here. We wanted to really better define what imminent is in academia and research, and just so we have that good definition going into our survey. So another definition we needed, of course, was how are things right now, like Michaela had said, are people of color and women being represented in the field of psychology? And also, looking at the piece of undergraduate students, are they able to recognize these eminent researchers, and especially are they able to recognize women and people of color? So, from all of that, we definitely decided that women and people of color have shown to be pretty underrepresented as eminent researchers in academia and research. So, therefore, we decided to look at the numbers. So in order to generate the names of the people that were going to be on our survey, we started with a general Google search of famous psychologists. And as you can see, the list that came up is mostly men. In fact, you had to scroll all the way to the end of this list to only come up with two women who were Anna Freud and Karen Horner. Because our initial search didn't yield very much information on female psychologists, we had to look at different websites, including the Association for Psychological Science, which included information on Ann Johnson and Eleanor McAbee. We also found a website that included a list of the top 10 psychologists and their accomplishments. And from there, we found information on Melanie Klein and, once again, Karen Horney and Anna Freud. Prior research by Woody, Viney, and Johns helped us uh, generate this final list of 21 female psychologists and 21 male psychologists. And we took this list and we applied it to a survey that we distributed to junior and senior psychology students that looked a bit like this. Um, we would basically have one of the names from our list, as you see here, our favorite Sigmund Freud. <laughs> and we have our student rate from zero being, I've never heard of him. One, I kind of know what he does, but only maybe one thing. He has some weird theories. <laughs> Two, I know a little more. I know why they're weird. Three, <laughs> I know I can tell you exactly what's going on. So we had them do that and state their experience with history and psychology courses as well. Does their university have one? Have they taken it? So in order to collect our data, we sent out our survey to students at Adams State University, Colorado, Colorado Mesa University, and we also got in touch with the Psychi Board to distribute our survey to other schools. We used social media and electronic sources like Facebook and Twitter, and also emailed the link out. So we collected 235 surveys from people whose ages ranged from 19 to 60 with a median age of 22. Our sample was made up mostly of women at almost 80%, and the rest were identified as female or other. Our ethnicity sample was predominantly white, non-Hispanic, and with the next most ranking ethnicity as Hispanic or Latin American. Most of our students that we got a survey from were seniors and the rest were juniors. We also asked students if they had taken or if their school offered a history and systems course. Only 40% said yes that they were currently enrolled and 21% said yes they did but they had not taken it. In addition we asked if their school offered a history of women in psychology course and once again almost 40 said yes they had taken it but 15% of these schools of the students that went to these schools, they didn't even offer a course in women in psychology. So, from all that, our first hypothesis that we formed was that female researchers that were imminent in the field of psychology we would be less recognized by junior and senior psychology students than their male counterparts. And our results show that to be true. <laughs> um, so, as you can see from my graph. Um, in this paired samples, non-parametric t-test, what we had is males were identified way easier by junior and senior psychology students as seen by their mean score here and compared to females here. 
So, our second hypothesis was that pioneers of psychology who are people of color would also have a lower mean recognition score by junior and senior psychology students when in comparison to their white counterparts. Yet again, our results show significant findings here. Um, we saw that white researchers were always able identified at a higher rate by junior and senior psychology students when compared to people of color overall. But to touch a bit on that intersectionality piece we had earlier, you even see over here the smallest bars are for women who are people of color in even comparison to white women. So the disparity is there and it's in a lot of different places. So finally, our third hypothesis. We suggested that psychology students who had taken a history in psychology course would definitely be able to uh, recognize the pioneers a bit better when controlling for GPA because we want to make sure that um, we have that variable there because students range just like their ability to recognize. So yet again, we found some significant results here. And in COVA revealed that we, or that junior and senior psychology students who had completed a history and systems course in psychology were significantly better than students who hadn't at recognizing eminent researchers in psychology as a whole. Uh, also note that although currently enrolled had a bit of a better score, it didn't have a significant difference when recognizing. So overall, eminent pioneers in psychology who are women and or people of color are recognized significantly less. And this reflects a national trend of gender and racial inequality. However, there is hope. For students who take a history and psychology course, they can increase their awareness and recognition of women and people of color in psychology. However, we still need to keep in mind that students who do take these courses are still recognizing women and people of color less. So that leads us to question, what are we teaching our students in these courses? So when we come to that, we look at the data that we find in the books. There's a low recognition of women and people of color in general history of psychology books. Uh, Woody, Viney, and Johns said that they neglected women and minorities, like their contribu contributions in the, the textbooks alone that there was a, even an omission of women from these books. Women were pressured into applied psychology, so they were pushed away from research or academia. In social psychology books, women and people of color are just greatly underrepresented. And their work is seen as subdiscipline contributions. They're not seen as the classic contributions that you would see. We looked at 67 total syllabi from the years of 2014 to 2017 across the nation, and we tallied the frequency of each book. Which, these are our five books that we came up with. They were generated, and with the help of Dr. Woody, um, he said that these were probably the best that we could have come up with. We used Vital Source Bookshelf, and we searched the table of contents for the names of our 42 people on our survey. Then we searched the body of the text for the specific terms of wife, daughter, woman, woman, and females. And then we continued to search the body of the text with the names from the survey, and we entered this all into an Excel sheet. We did a three-stage manual review with first reviewer, which did the initial check. The second reviewer double-checked and went through exactly what they did and the third reviewer went through to find any discrepancies to make sure everything matched up. We then entered all of this information from the Excel sheet into NVivo, which is a data content analysis software that sees relationship or sentiments of emotional tone. Okay. So then from there, we're going to go ahead and talk about the results now. So when we went through and analyzed the table of contents, we had found that all males named, well, all males, well, all mentions of males had 272 counts to them. That's a pretty big number for just five books, but when it came to females, we saw a very discouraging number of only 30 mentions. And that's for any name that was not even on the list by itself, but if we want to see even bigger numbers, we can look at the body of the text. So in total, from our list, we found a mention of 6,360 names. And from there, we had a majority of them being male, which was 5,802, which made up 91.2%. 
If you want to keep going, go ahead and keep going, but it's going to cut into your five-minute Q&A time, okay? All right, yep, I'll go right ahead and do that. So, of course, men made up a vast majority of that with 91.2%, but just to cut short and go right down to the nitty-gritty, is that we see intersectionality definitely playing a big role here, as we only had 0.2% of mentions being women of color. So there's definitely a big issue occurring with minorities as well as the mention of women. So then from here, another thing to look at is just from these mentions alone, we broke it down to look at the top mention. So of course our favorite, Sigmund Freud, was 1,383 counts to his name, but then for the top mention female, that was Mary Whitten Calkins, which only had 118 counts to her name. And then break it up even further, we looked at a husband-wife pairing of Kenneth Bancroft Clark and then Mamie Phipps Clark. So Kenneth Bancroft Clark, the uh, husband of the two, had 42 counts to his name, whereas Mamie only had 14. And what we got to keep in mind there as well is that a lot of them did a lot of research together. In fact, most of their research was done together. So to see such a major, um, well, to see just a huge difference between the 42 counts of uh, Kenneth to the 14 of Mamie is kind of shocking. So then I go from there. In, in vivo, we of course looked at the emotional tone of all those passages that we, and that uh, included counts of daughter, female, wife, or woman in those messages of those passages. And what we found there is that a vast majority of them had a moderately negative tone behind them, with of course being followed with only nine counts less with moderately positive. But however, if we looked at the very negative, very positive tones, we find that very negative had 220 counts whereas very positive had only 101. So it's pretty shocking when we see almost double the number, actually a little more than double the number, of very negative compared to very positive tones. And one thing to keep in mind with that as well too, is that we had no control for this. So this may just be the way that history books are written out. So they may just naturally have a negative tone, even when it comes to writing about males. But it's definitely something that we see in regards to females. So overall, we, um, oh actually, in conclusion as well too, is that Navilo produced a word cloud of a lot of the words that came associated with all those passages. From there we saw a big one such as woman, but we even saw a lot of other good words such as doctoral, we saw period, female, um, United States psychologists and scientists. However, we also see mentions of some possibly negative words such as children, which could be related back to the fact that a lot of women were kind of forced into working with areas of children development as well as generally if they were to marry and to have children, that was basically a career ender for most females at the time as well too. So from there, um, I will take on the, for this is just three main points that we can conclude. Is that overall, while psychology is predominantly female field, there is definitely a lot of issues with low recognition, low representation of women. And this is especially true for people of color and even more so for um, women of color as well. Because as we mentioned before, is that only 2% of, well, 0.2% of all mentions in those textbooks went to women of color. So there is a big issue with that. And continuing on, is that as we are having a predominantly female field, and we are having more minorities join in the field, that we actually have an issue where social and cultural needs are not being met by our classrooms today. Is because in a lot of our history and psychology classrooms, we are pushing a lot of emphasis on these white, um, old professors and whatnot that you basically went through and taught psychology and it seems to be holding into that area. So we generally have a big issue in regards of that. So on the note of education, is if we don't change the way that we educate, this bias will generally continue. And what do I mean by this bias? Well, this bias is generally the problem of the great man. And this is where that his, well, this is the way that history has been written, in which it's been written in perspective of just white men. It's been written by them and it's been written in their perspective and its focus is solely on them. So if we can perhaps go through and actually start writing about and educating more on people of color, as well as um, just women, then we can perhaps see a change occur with that. And overall, we just, um, and a few differences that we're actually making on our own, aside from just changing education, is the I Am Psych National Tour. So what it is, is generally it's a multi multimedia initiative that kind of focuses on educating individuals about uh, women of color. And that's exactly what me and the rest of my classmates here will be doing at the Rocky Mountain Psychological Association Conference upcoming pretty soon. And we'll be going through and we'll be uh, educating a lot of the conference goers about, of course, women of color and give them the recognition that they really do deserve. So on that note, just a few little acknowledgments we'd like to give. It's just to Dr. Nikki Jones of Colorado Mason University and then Dr. William Douglas Woody of Northern Colorado University as well as the Psych High Board of Directors 
and then for Deanna Floriani. And overall, I'd like to thank you for your time, and I don't think we really have time for questions, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. <laughs>